Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 11th session of Kapodoshi University's special program titled A Common Horizon for Humanity and the Planet. This is indeed a very exciting uh, and a vigorous project about rethinking of the humanities and social sciences and how we can address the environmental challenges humanity, humans, and the entire planet uh, is facing. And as part of this project, the university has initiated a series of conversations with global public intellectuals on this current crisis. This is all about how we can understand the roots uh, of this uh, crisis and how do we respond uh, to these multifaceted problems. And in fact, the goal of this project uh, is to bring together leading thinkers and intellectuals from around the world to create an inter uh, international in intellectual platform um, to discuss the future of humanity, to discuss the future of the planet, and to build uh, kind of a holistic synergy uh, and uh, to think about building again a common horizon. And uh, so far, there have been 10 programs with distinguished lecturers. Um, you can already watch these. Uh, these are already on YouTube uh, with uh, subtitles prepared in Turkish and English. Today, uh, we are honored to have Professor Simon Esta, who is a senior research fellow at Sungunkan University. This is South Korea's first and oldest university. Uh, I, it is my honor uh, to introduce Professor Estok. Um, first of all, he is the editor of uh, the journal Neovelcon, and he is an elected member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, Estok teaches literary theory, eco-criticism, and Shakespearean literature. He has an award-winning book called Eco-Criticism and Shakespeare, Reading Ecophobia, that appeared uh, in 2011, and it was uh, reprinted in 2014. He is also the co-editor of five books, um, Anthropocene Ecologies of Food, uh, which came out from Routledge in April uh, 2022, actually, which is very new. Uh, Mushroom Clouds, Ecological Approaches to Militarization and the Environment in the East Asia, that again came out from Routledge in 2021 another recent book, uh, Landscape, Seascape, and the Eco-Spatial Imagination uh, that was published in 2016, International Perspectives in Feminist Eco-Criticism from 2013, and East Asian Eco-Criticism, again from 2013. Uh, his latest book uh, is uh, much anticipated, The Ecophobia Hypothesis. That was published in 2018, and uh, it was reprinted with Errata as paperback in 2020. Um, I'm very happy to uh, also announce that it has been translated into Turkish by Dr. Sibel Dinchal and published by Cappadocia University uh, Press here in Cappadocia. Uh, the same book is currently being translated into Chinese and Korean. Uh, Professor Estok has also published uh, in, uh, numerous uh, articles on eco-criticism and Shakespeare in such prestigious journals as PMLA, Mosaic, Configurations, English Studies in Canada, and many others. He is currently working on a book about slime in the Western cultural and literary imagination. Today, he'll be talking on COVID-19 and ecophobia. Thank you um, very much for that kind introduction. And before I begin, I would like to offer some thanks, uh, my, my gratitude to the people who have made this uh, possible. The rector of Cappadocia University, Hassan Ali Karasa, uh, Associate Professor Shafak uh, Oguz, uh, Professor uh, Sinan Akili, and uh, Professor Sherpa Operman. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for making this possible. As we near, my, my topic is COVID-19 and the ecophobic reflex. And as we near the midway point of another 
um, very rough year, it's perhaps a good time to take stock of some of the lessons that we have learned on our journey through the pandemic. And my topic today is how our responses to the pandemic are at times more than simply fear and um, need to be understood as ecophobia. Uh, one of the things that we need to, to look at is how the depth of the relationship between these two, between, um, between COVID-19 and the ecophobic um, reflex have become ever stronger as we have experienced the progress of the, of the pandemic, uh, the progress of the disease. And before beginning in earnest, I, I should like to briefly define uh, ecophobia as it's a, a term that uh, still requires uh, definition. And I'll offer a, a more nuanced definition uh, as I go through um, the talk. In the book that uh, Professor Operman mentioned that has just been translated into Turkish, uh, the ecophobia hypothesis, uh, published by Rutledge um, a few years ago, uh, I, I write about ecophobia as a spectrum condition, one that uh, is manifest in several different forms, ranging from fear to a lack of mindfulness, from outright contempt to a kind of blasé indifference. On the other end of the spectrum, and if we understand ecophobia as a part of a spectrum, uh, is the idea of biophilia. Uh, which Eric Fromm defines as a passionate love of all that is alive. It's a term that E.O. Wilson further developed, the late E.O. Wilson uh, from Harvard University, developed in his uh, very influential book, The Biophilia Hypothesis, to which my book was uh, a direct response. The problem with the idea that we are biophilic and that uh, we, we love nature is that it just doesn't explain some of the bad things that we do uh, to the environment, simply put. Bad things that have resulted both in our current climate crisis and in the current pandemic. The pandemic is uh, an environmental issue. So I'd like briefly to discuss the second matter, the, the pandemic as an environmental issue before moving on. The earliest focus on the sources of the disease revealed that our chronically exploitative relationships with animals need immediate attention. The disease is, after all, zoonotic. Uh, zoonosis is the term for the transcorporeal disease from one species to another. History is pretty clear on the matter of zoonosis. Uh, Jared Diamond succinctly explains that, and I quote him here, questions of the animal origins of human disease lie behind the broadest patterns pattern in human history and behind some of the most important issues in human health today. For Diamond, disease is one of the prime movers of human society, along with war and industrialization, uh, with which the disease is, is intimately linked. Diamond reminds us that, and I quote here, the major killers of humanity throughout our recent history, smallpox, smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, and cholera, are infectious diseases that evolved from the diseases of animals. But there are several others uh, that Diamond doesn't mention, some of which post-date uh, his book, Bird Flu, uh, 2013, SARS, uh, 2002, Swine Flu, 2009, Mad Cow Disease, 1996, Ebola, <clears throat> 1976, uh, and you know there are, there are websites uh, that uh, we can search through and surf through to to, to find out more about these. I don't think it needs men mentioning, but I will just in case that um, our chronically exploitative relationship with with animals is based in ecophobia, no less than patriarchal exploitation of women is based in misogyny or then Nazism is based in anti-Semitism. And I'll loop back to zoonosis uh, later in this talk, but would like uh, just for a brief moment to say a bit more about ecophobia and why the need for the term. So when men are prejudiced against women and fearful of their agency, uh, this is called sexism. 
when people are prejudiced against other races and are fearful of their agency, this is called racism. When straight people are prejudiced against the uh, LGBTQI community and are fearful of their agency, this is called homophobia. And when people discriminate on the basis of species and are fearful of the agency of other animals, this is called speciesism. This is all pretty basic stuff. So what's the discrimination against the environment? Well, this is pretty simple. It's when, uh, this is what we, we, we call ecophobia. Uh, it's when people are prejudiced against nature and fearful of its agency. And it manifests in such phrases as mother nature and in ideas about nature being our enemy. The aspect of ecophobia that concerns us most immediately with pandemics is what I'm calling our chronically exploitative relationship with animals. Rather than attend to our chronically exploitative relationship with animals, which is the real root of the problem, the world's most powerful leader at the time seized on the pandemic as an opportunity to conceptualize the disease along nationalist lines with phrases such as Kung flu and Chinese virus. Uh, Mr. Trump is certainly, certainly was not alone in doing this, and there's a long history of such behavior. Indeed, as Priscilla Wald explains in her remarkable and in many ways prescient uh, book, 2008 book entitled Contagious Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative, quote, surfacing routinely in outbreak accounts, pandemic discourse establishes disease outbreaks as foreign or alien agents that pose a national threat. But whatever the political configurations of a given nation with China, we need to be pellucidly clear that the disease did not come from the Chinese. It came from animals. As with 75% of the other diseases we suffer, animals and the flesh that some people eat from them are the core origin of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the sine qua non of human vulnerability to death and unprecedented changes that the pathogen offers. COVID, like the Black Death before it, is, we must be clear, an environmental event. In his environmental history of medieval Europe, Richard Hoffman explains that the, that the Black Death was the largest ecological and demographic event in pre-modern European history. Citing um, Hoffman, medievalist Sean Normandon argues that the social effects of the pandemic, the disappearance of villages, the collapse of economies, the changes in agricultural practices and so on had profound effects that we can to some degree chart in the literature of the time. The COVID-19 pandemic is an environmental catastrophe also with its own winners and losers. So let's keep this, mind, this phrase in mind, winners and losers, because I'm gonna be coming back to it shortly. Pandemics turn caution into fear and fear into phobias. And COVID-19 shows this well with the whole matter of sanitizing and please don't misunderstand what, what I'm saying here. I sanitize as much as everyone else. Uh, in so doing, I am like the rest of us, ignoring the fundamentality of microbial worlds to our very existence. Worlds that compulsive sanitizing threatens. We need to teach our children well. It is very likely that our efforts, combined with the limits of the virus itself, will spell the end of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, or at the very least, it's taming. But that's not the end of the story. And at some point, we really do need to think about what all of the sanitizing has done and how the effects of it will come back to haunt us. I'm not talking about Trump's idea that we drink disinfectant, but I am concerned rather with the microbial worlds inside our bodies. And I will talk extensively about this um, in a few moments. First, however, I'd like to mention that since COVID-19 began, I have found myself reading a lot of pandemic literature and have been surprised by 
just how much we're going through is not new and how much novelists have already written about such experiences that seemed to me so singular to our history. Albert Camus, for instance, stated decades ago in his novel, The Play, something that I had thought was a much more contemporary popular recognition that, quote, what is natural is the microbe. Microbes are a fundamental part of nature indeed. But even as I say this, and I will show throughout this talk, it is a recognition that has been and remains fiercely, and you know, looking for the right word here, um, resented. The world's microbes create, without question, are the imagined enemies in the pandemics that uh, we experience. They are the agential enemy. And in many important ways, the COVID-19 pandemic capitalizes on our fears, firstly, highlighting how a confluence of adaptive strategies can really work against our best long-term interests. And secondly, raising questions about just how to respond to mortal threats. That is how to respond when under siege, when we are terrified. The response of George W. Bush to the 9-11 terror attacks was a re reflex response to hit back, to create an enemy terror and to wage war on it, the war on terror. It was a nationalistic and inherently racist response. If there's one thing that characterizes the COVID-19 pandemic more than the actual virus itself, it would have to be fear. And the, in this case, ecophobic re reflex is to demonize that source of fear. In her famous book, Illness as Metaphor, Susan Sontag points out how, quote, feelings about evil are projected onto a disease and disease so enriched by meanings is projected onto the world. This remark implies complex, relations, complex relationships between the subject and object world, between the imagined and the real, and between our abilities to grasp the emotional and the indifferent. And nature, to be sure, is utterly indifferent. Priscilla Wald reminds us that nature is far from benign. At least it has no special sentiment for the welfare of the human versus other species. Neither, however, is nature evil. Yet among researchers, as Wald continues, Quote, the microbes are not only sinister, outbreak accounts manifest researchers respect for and even awe for of their foe. Even so, it bears repeating that nature is indifferent. And this is a concept we simply find difficult to digest, especially if we look at the picture on my slide here. That does not look like the face of indifference, but it is. The microbe and the virus don't think or feel any more than a rock falling would think, hey, I'm going to fall. Oh, it, it, it just falls. Carrot Diamond uh, is, of course, being a bit tongue in cheek in characterizing microbes as, quote, damned clever uh, in how they modify our bodies or our behaviors such that we become enlisted to spread microbes. But he knows, and we knows, we know that. Uh, it, it's not cleverness. It's the logic of genetic mutation. And it's the logic of genetic mutation in a huge population with a short generation. It is pure chance, not cleverness. And for all of our cleverness, genetic chance does not rule in our favor. Not with our long wait for, quote, gene frequencies from generation to generation. While microbes have a genetic advantage over us, however, our cleverness is a potent response. I write today with a modified, genetically modified, with genetically modified uh, material, the mRNA vaccine coursing through my system. Even so, viruses can mutate quicker than we can develop responses, and they do it by chance, and they have a lot of chances. Uh, they do it by chance in order to perpetuate themselves wherever and whenever possible and without emotion. It is the power of these infinitesimally small and unintelligent, unintelligent life forms uh, 
it's the power that they have over us that evokes the ecophobic response, the ecophobic reflex. We're scared of it. Not just scared of it, we're really scared of it. It's utterly disempowering, ego deflating, to use Jared Diamond's phrase, to think that a brainless and infinitesimally small thing can take us down. Perhaps nowhere is this more eloquent or succinctly put than by the character Sam Daniels in the film Outbreak. And I'll just play just a little snippet of it. I think it's nice hearing it. You have to love its simplicity. It's one billionth our size and it's beating us. So what do you want to do, take it to dinner? No. It's one billionth of our size and it's beating us. Because this is unfathomable and incomprehensible and in so many ways unacceptable, we project notions of the sort that Sontag describes. Who or what can unravel our carefully crafted tapestry, our intricate global web of production and distribution, our delicate financial networks and chains? We're reluctant to see nature as indifferent. Wald argues that nothing better illustrates the reluctance to accept this indifference uh, toward human beings and the turn from the ecological analysis and accounts of emerging infections of all varieties than the seemingly irresistible tendency to animate the microbial foe. Isn't it, after all, better to imagine a vindictive and evil microbe moving like a suave devil uh, with the best laid plans rather than a brainless and virtually invisible thing undoing our everything. And the fact that we just can't make them go away is all the more taunting to our powerfully exceptionalist mentalities. It's nothing short of haunting when Camus ends his novel promising that, quote, the plague Basilus never dies or vanishes entirely. Earlier I mentioned winners and losers and I'd like to come back to this. Yes. Amazon.com has been a big winner. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the losers, not the financial victims, though there are many, but the long-term biological losers. Efforts to wipe out dangerous microbes we need to remember will have long-term consequences. The smallest of all microbes, viruses, provoke retaliatory responses from us that can produce worse results than the virus itself. The questions about social responsibilities versus individual liberties aside, serious as they are, pale before what are clearly more important biological questions, none of which are currently being addressed uh, in mainstream media or public or popular scientific peer-reviewed research. These questions need immediate attention. In 2019, not long before the COVID-19 pandemic, I wrote uh, in a interdisciplinary studies in literature and environment uh, journal article as follows, and I've received some hostile responses for this. I wrote, uh, here's the quote. Today, as Michael Pollan notes in a different discussion about fermentation, the microbial world is regarded foremost as a mortal threat. The legacy of Louis Pasteur, he explains, is a century-long war on bacteria, a war in which most of us have volunteered or been enlisted. We deploy our antibiotics and our hand sanitizers and deodorants and boiling water and pasteurization and federal regulations to hold off the rot and mold and bacteria, and so we hope hold off disease and death. Pollen calls it germophobia, but it's also known as micro biophobia, mysophobia, verminophobia, bacillophobia, and bacteriophobia, all of them clearly falling under the rubric of ecophobia, which, as I have suggested elsewhere, plays out in many spheres, including the personal hygiene and cosmetic industries. These words are as true now as they were before the pandemic, notwithstanding hostile responses. I promised earlier to come back to this and I'll, I'll do so now, compulsive use of hand sanitizers in public venues is a recent example of our obsessive fear of dirt and bacteria. Again, to be clear, I use hand sanitizer. There's a hand sanitizer about a meter away from me. 
the reality is that our body is comprised of more non-human than human DNA and obsessive hand sanitizing is more harmful in the long run than it is beneficial in that we're killing microorganisms that are beneficial to our own survival. For instance, we need intestinal flora in order to digest our food, regulate our immune system and reduce inflammation. The gut flora, these bacteria produce antimicrobial substances that outnumber the total number of cells in the human body by a thousand percent, that's 10 to one. The biological questions that we are doing to future generations with our compulsive hand sanitizing needs attention. Now, because this is such a public, public venue, such a public sphere that, that I have here, I wanna be clear that on no level am I saying we should not be sanitizing our hands uh, during a pandemic. This is not what I'm saying. But we do need to be doing it uh, with as much knowledge of the potential damage that we're doing to the future as we can. So compulsive hand sanitizing needs our attention. No less does our sense of being besieged, outnumbered and under attack by our microscopic companions need attention. Imagining war rather than cohabitation with microbes will not help us in the long run. And the fact remains that we are more microbe than human. There will be blood for tearing into microbial ecosystems. We are facing a serious loss, one that has nothing to do with personal liberties or social freedoms. Before COVID-19, the growth of the Anthropocene, with the growth of the Anthropocene, we had already begun to face, quote, the loss, uh, Margaret McFall Guy explains, and that's where the quote, we are more microbe than human comes from. We had begun to face the loss of the complex microbial worlds, both within and beyond organismal bodies, worlds that make nearly all life possible. These microbial worlds are absolutely essential for us, and yet we're tearing them apart willy-nilly with our hand sanitizers. Again, not to be repetitious, I, I do want to be clear that I'm not on any level arguing against the need for good hygiene. Uh, in the COVID-19 era, era, but we do need to be aware that there will be blood for this. Summarizing the work of Carl Weiss, uh, McFarlane Guy describes how by the early 1990s, it had become clear that the Earth's biological diversity is far more microbial than ever imagined, and that microbes don't just rule the world, they make every life form possible, and they've been doing so since the beginning of evolutionary time. McFarlane Guy summarizes important arguments about, quote, how bacteria matter not only in themselves, but also in relation to other living beings who depend on them for processes as basic as bodily development. She spells, out, she spells it out so that even the most non-scientific of readers can clearly understand. She says, bacteria are not only changing the way our guts behave, their metabolic products interact with our entire bodies in complicated ways that we're just beginning to explore. For example, we're finding out that gut bacteria have significant impacts on our brains, affecting the ways we think and feel. Citing the work of Yan Wang and Lloyd H. Casper, McFarlane Guy contends that, quote, there is growing evidence that the presence or absence of certain microbial strains is linked to depression, anxiety, and autism. So why in the world is there no media attention to the possible harm that our anti, I mean, no mainstream media attention to the possible harm that our antiseptic, antibiotic, compulsive sanitizing might be doing to the future, to our future, to our children and our grandchildren? At least part of the answer simply is quite simply that we do indeed suffer from that branch of ecophobia that Michael Pollan called germophobia. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, his words could not be timelier. We should make no mistake about it, that our reactions have become more phobic than rational. And we should be equally clear that these often phobic reactions have saved countless lives. I'm aware of how contradictory this sounds. 
since I have always and have here also maintained that survival responses are not in and of themselves ecophobia. But there's a very important qualifier that we need here. We need to understand that even survival responses are ecophobic, are ecophobic when they are simply reflexes, responses based on no material or empirical facts, just fear with no rational or reasonable basis. I know how unsatisfactory uh, and wishy-washy this sounds, but we know that there is a slippery thing here that we're trying to define. And no doubt about it, a solid definition is elusive. Everything, everything has a reason. Fear and phobias are no exception. Animals don't naturally fear people. It's only once we have shown ourselves to be dangerous that they learn to fear us. Much of what we had had to be fearful about in our evolutionary history is now just a part of history. When my children were younger, um, they were scared of the dark. I told them that there was nothing to be scared of. It's a lesson we all learned as children, namely that it's okay to turn off the lights and go to sleep. And that the fear of the dark that many of us felt as children is uh, dormant in most of us as adults. The reality, however, uh, is that dark places have, in fact, been dangerous for diurnal animals like us in their evolutionary history. What the COVID-19 pandemic has done is to awaken a lot of dormant fear, primarily about microbes, but also, as I will explain uh, a little bit later, about animals. As we all know, the pandemic has brought to the fore questions about the security of our freedom, our agency, and our deepest personal lives. Personal liberties and secrets dissolve as much in the narratives microbes tell as in the outbreak narratives humans create. And I'd like to give a quotation here from uh, Priscilla Wald again. Microbes tell the often hidden story of who has been where and when and what they did there. Contagion, that is, charts and social interactions that are often not otherwise visible. And the manifestations of those contacts and connections is another important feature of outbreak narratives. In what we perceive through an ecophobic reflex, reflexive understanding as a threat to our individuality is a chance to re-envision ourselves and our relationships with the world. To come back to the work of Margaret McFall Guy, we might do well to listen to the argument for the need to see bacteria less as disease-causing invaders than as potential symbiotic partners, something that is not happening in microbiology circles. Uh, and I think of a quotation here again, human bodies can no longer be seen as fortress fortresses to defend against microbial onslaught, but must be re-envisioned as nested ecosystems. Moreover, given that individuals are ecosystems, it becomes clear that the loss of a single species probably entails the loss of many kinds, not just one. Attention to microbial life raises the specter that our extinction crisis may be even more serious than we thought. Bell Guy concludes powerfully that in the era of the Anthropocene, noticing microbial worlds seems more important than ever. A sense of embeddedness must replace our sense of individual privilege and, and our sense of exceptionalism. And again, uh, more about uh, exceptionalism shortly. I mentioned earlier that pandemics turn caution into fear and fear into phobias and that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic shows this well. I've shown how our compulsive sanitizing is troubling for its ecophobic overtones, but it is a reflexive action that is troubling for another reason. It treats a symptom and not a cause. It's like a Band-Aid for cancer or a COP26 meeting that talks about carbon emissions without addressing food. I'll digress a little bit here. It's not a real digression since it does relate centrally to our topic. About the uh, COP meeting in, uh, I think it was November, 
COP26 meeting. Uh, one source read as follows. You might expect the world's biggest climate change conference to opt for eco-friendly menus, given the clamor to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, yet the, men the menu at COP26 in Glasgow is almost 60% meat or dairy. It's like serving cigarettes at a lung cancer conference. As long as such illogical decisions are being made, the climate emergency will never be resolved. The stress in COVID-19 media about sanitizing similarly treats a symptom, the disease, and I've already mentioned that the cause of our chronically ecophobic relationship with animals is simply not in the picture. But what I've not mentioned is how the pandemic hits us at our most ecophobic weak spot, more fear of animals themselves. Pandemics in some way level the field, reminding us that we're not so different from the rest of the world. One of the interesting things about the COVID-19 pandemic is how it has revealed our animalistic responses and thus called into question our sense of our own exceptionalism. Uh, our responses to danger are natural. When, uh, a da when danger appears, a, a flock of birds takes flight. A school of fish flees. A colony of mud skippers retreats to their holes. And people stay at home. We're not all that different from other animals. Our vulnerabilities reflect our affinities. Like other animals, we are susceptible to disease, even extinction. A large part of this whole issue has to do with our inflated sense of the supremacy of our own individuality. Indeed, many of the crises we currently face are the dangerous ecological effects of our notions about our own individuality. And part of the horror of the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, how, it, how it is a challenge to such notions. Ed Young has put the case well. He says, no matter how we squint at the problem, it's clear that microbes subvert our notions of individuality. And these microbes, as I noted in the first few moments of my talk, are zoonotic. And as I promised uh, to return to the topic, I will do so now. Not recognizing zoonotic origins of disease means ignoring human, non-human entanglements, ignoring, uh, to borrow uh, a phrase from Nicole Shukin, the, quote, liberal longing for interspecies intimacy that circulates concurrently, longing for post-human kinship. But it can also result, as Shukin has noted, in extraordinary speciesism and ecophobia. Keith Thomas most famously commented that, quote, it is impossible to disentangle what people of the past thought about plants and animals from what they thought about themselves. These entanglements have been hierarchical in Western thinking. Eastern philosophies and religions, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Taoism, and others are a different story, and they're not the topic of my uh, talk here uh, today. Indeed, it's ironic that while, quote, Western society has fostered a culture of caring for animals, it has maintained humanity's right to kill and eat them. Uh, this is from Tristan uh, Stewart's The Bloodless Revolution of Cultural History of uh, Vegetarianism. I'm reminded here of Michael Pollan's comments that, quote, half the dogs in America will receive Christmas presents this year, yet few of us pause to consider the miserable life of the pig, an animal easily as intelligent as a dog that becomes the Christmas ham. What enables this paradox is a sense of the authority uh, from an imagined divinity that gives men dominion over animals and over women. I'd like to um, go into a, a little aside here. Um, to my mind, one of the most memorable uh, sets of images uh, of animal hauntings that co-locate speciesism and sexism is from Ang Lee's, Lee Ang's The Butcher's Wife. The butcher is a man, I'll just give a, a very brief summary of it. The butcher is a man who, who beats and rapes his wife by night and slaughters pigs by day. Uh, the narrator explicitly relates the slaughter of animals with, with hauntings by those very animals. After years and years of slaughtering countless animals, he was visited every night by ghostly pigs 
bleeding on his doorstep, or so people said. On his wedding night, he practically ra rapes his bride and, quote, her screams of pain were so loud and lasted so long, according to her neighbors, that some people who heard them above the whistling night winds took them to be the, the bleeding of ghostly pigs. To come back to my main topic, the use of animals for labor, entertainment, clothing, and food clearly presents something contradictory. It's not just the pigs and dogs Michael Pollan mentions. Our relationship with animals understood as a God-given right uh, in Western cultural history goes against the commandment from the same God not to cause suffering to animals. Uh, in Hebrew, Tsar ba ale chayim, which literally refers to not causing suffering to the owners of life, and the Talmudic tradition generally understands owners of life ba ale to refer to animals. Notwithstanding the long contradictory behaviors with animals within Judeo-Christian thinking, human and non-human lives has been, are, and always will be interwoven and history will repeat and haunt humanity until we learn its lessons. Nicole Shukin uh, worries about the failures to recognize these entanglements and states that, quote, the abandonment of hope of a mutually benefiting material coexistence with other species is possibly the most terrifying prospect of all. A failure to recognize the ongoing material intercourse between human and non-human animals, the movement of material in and through bodies that Stacey Alamo has called transcorporeality, tacitly reaffirms the exceptionality of the human, casting the non-human into a negligible space. Such a reaffirmation virtually guarantees a skewed understanding of human, non-human animal relations in which the non-human becomes the antagonist, the demonized agent of harm against the human. In Shukin's words, while biomobility is suggestive of a radical ontological breakdown of species distinctions and distance under present conditions of global capitalism, it also brings into view new discourses and technology seeking to secure human health through the segregation of human and animal life and finding in the specter of a pandemic a universal rationale for institutionalizing speciesism on a hitherto unprecedented scale. Ignoring or downplaying human non-human entanglements and transfers of genetic materials among species has complex causes and implications. There are several issues that uh, require comment here. Firstly, genes, like microbes, obviously don't have motives in an emotional or psychological sense, but we should make no mistake about it that they are motivated to reproduce, an idea that we find very troubling in large part because it threatens our sense of individuality. But Richard Dawkins explains, individuals are not stable things, they are fleeting. Chromosomes too are shuffled into oblivion like hands of cards soon after they are dealt, but the cards themselves uh, survive the shuffling. The cards are the genes. The genes are not destroyed. Not destroyed by crossing over, they merely change partners and march on. Of course they march on. That's their business. They're the replicators and we're, we are their survival machines. When we have secured our purpose, we are cast aside. But genes are denizens of geological time. Genes are forever. The genes that run microbes then do have motives that really haunt humanity. The other issue, and we've seen it in Diamond's remark uh, about damned clever microbes and in the demonizing of microbes that Wald and Sontag discussed, is the whole question of antagonism embedded in his comments about understanding and beating the enemy. Part of what guarantees fear during a pandemic is the perception of danger in the agency of genomic material. Columbia University Assistant Professor of Medicine Siddhartha Mukherjee writes that, quote, one of the most powerful and dangerous ideas in the history of science is the gene, the fundamental unit of heredity and the basic unit of all biological information. He identifies two other dangerous ideas, the atom and the bite, arguing that each represents the irreducible unit, the building block, the basic organizational unit of a larger whole, the atom of matter, the bite or bit, 
of digitalized information, the gene of heredity and biological information. He goes on to state that, to state what we know cerebrally but not viscerally, namely that it is impossible to understand organismal and cellular biology or evolution or human pathology, behavior, temperament, illness, race, and identity or fate without first reckoning with the concept of the gene. This of course begs the question uh, of agency outside of genes. Do we have any free will at all or any individuality? Famed entomologist, the late uh, Edward Wilson, E.O. Wilson, who, um, who we've already met today as the father of the biophilia hypothesis, speaks directly to the question about the relationship between genes and agency. And I'd like to uh, read uh, this quote from him uh, here. He says that genes hold culture on a leash. The leash is very long, but inevitably values will be constrained in accordance with their effects on the human gene pool. The brain is a product of evolution. Human behavior, like the deep, deepest capacities for emotional response, which drive and guide it, is the circuitous technique by which human genetic material has been and will be kept intact. Morality has no other demonstrable function. Hara Haruki Murakami puts it more forcefully in his epic novel, 1Q84, saying, human beings are ultimately nothing but carriers, passageways for genes. They ride us into the ground like racehorses from generation to generation. Genes don't think about what constitutes good or evil. They don't care whether we're happy or unhappy. We're just means to an end for them. They only think about what is most efficient for them. Dawkins rhymes in even more succinctly. They go by the name of genes and we are their survival machines. However we word it, the thought is terrifying. Our sense of agency is overblown. This is perhaps the single most important insight of new materials thinking, and it has profound implications for how we think about matter and how they matter. The development of interest in the gene over the past hundred years is very encouraging because it may very well help to dislodge us from our destructive sense of, of exceptionalism. It may call into question our hubris, hubris in our own agency and overcome biases against less sophisticated organisms, including things that haunt us and cause deadly pandemics. One of the matters that's crucial here is precisely about how bias against less sophisticated, less complicated organisms is dangerous. To what degree do cultural matters such as class and hierarchical thinking prevent us from addressing agent, the agency of pathogens at least until, uh, at least until a, pa a pandemic begins? with the same vim and vigor that we address perceived th threats to national security, for instance. What do we make of the resonances between, between terrorism and pandemics, since these clearly do not translate into equal funding? Military spending far outweighs healthcare spending globally. One of the ways to come at these issues is to recognize that there are common misconceptions about evolution and how it works, a point Norwegian professor of molecular biology, Andreas Hedgenal, has made well. Hedgenal argues that uh, the evolution, he argues that misconceptions that evolution proceeds from simple to complex and that less complex animal groups are eventually superseded remain not only in textbooks, but also among zoologists. They deserve our attention because they matter. They shape our thinking about biology of life, the biology of life, and have consequences for what we find important to investigate. The top bottom metaphors, humans are at the top of a tree or a ladder, while bacteria and viruses are at the bottom, that Janelle shows, have proved particularly discouraging to form some forms of investigation. More than this, however, such metaphors predispose us to underestimating pathogens. And given the fact that one of the met metaphors for comprehending human pathogen relations is a military one, 
we are in a war against them, such a predisposition is particularly dangerous. No one would underestimate the deadly potentials of a hammer in the hands of a psychopathic killer, even though hammers are utterly unsophisticated and are among the most ancient of human tools. A hammer is no magnetic reflux, no magnetic flux generator that fires projectiles without any kind of chemical explosive, but it can kill and dead is dead. This example is perhaps not a good one. It's problematical, obviously, because while a magnetic flux generator uh, is a, uh, a result of an evolution that has proceeded from simplicity to complexity, biological evolution doesn't quite work in that way. We are incredibly sophisticated organisms. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we imagine, therefore, that we are above far less sophisticated pathogens that threaten and haunt our existence. We will win the war because we are better, or so the thinking goes. The reality, however, is that our survival has never been guaranteed. Because, our, because of our misconceptions about evolution and our ecophobia, and our sense of our own exceptionalism, we willingly forget our vulnerabilities when each pandemic or plague passes and we think we've won. We do well to heed the ominous warning Camus offers about the plague never disappearing. Our refusal to reckon with pathogens as permanent co-inhabitants of the world is, part, is a part of our utilitarian ethics, our understanding of the rest of the world not as partners, but as commodities for our use. And it's a worldview that has led to a spiraling out of control. One of the implications of global corporate capitalism is that biomobility has all sorts of possibilities unique to our point in history. Indeed, Shukin explains that, quote, because globalization unwittingly supplies the conditions for disease to travel rapidly, and because a future pandemic will, by all accounts, be zoonotic, that is animal in origin, the species line emerges as a prominent material stress line in neoliberal culture. Written in 2009, those words today are nothing shy of haunting. Shukin also explains that, quote, pandemic discourse speculates in the coming of an event that threatens to precipitate the collapse of the global economy and a hard reckoning with materiality, and that interspecies exchanges that were once local or place specific are experienced as global in their potential effects. We are currently making those hard reckonings and finding that the global effects of COVID-19 are simply too big to conceptualize. As pandemics and disease have haunted our steps, so too have the representational problems that they offer, solutions to which may, in fact, make things worse. There are some very unsavory implications to how we are beating the pandemic enemy. One of these has to do with violent metaphors of control. Another has to do with violent actions of control. And both of these uh, require uh, our attention. Pandemics and plagues defy control or predictability, and it's this that makes them so frightening and urgent. There are other diseases out there that are deadly, cancer and heart disease, for instance, but these do not arouse the sense of urgency that COVID-19 does. Among the reasons that COVID-19 does so are its novelties, which paradoxically engenders a more visceral sense of unpredictability than cancer or heart disease while also evoking the sense that it can be beat, while both cancer and heart disease have consistently proven unbeatable. COVID-19, like terror, produces reflexive responses, isomorphically similar to terror attacks and indeed to climate change. We imagine that pandemics corner us and throw down the gauntlet, and this evokes fiery responses laced with military metaphors that drip from a chismo. Shukin notes the, quote, chilling resonances between a discourse of pandemic preparedness and the imperial rhetoric and machinery of the war against terrorism, 
and presciently observes that pandemic discourse prepares us for a new imperial war against nature, end quote. But the similarities don't stop there. Indeed, war and disease both uh, have been with humanity for time immemorial, and yet they continue to surprise us. Now, this is one of the key themes of Camus' The Plague. Despite our long history with pandemics and plagues, as with wars and social unrest, we're never really prepared for them when they come. Uh, Camus says, pestilence is in fact very common, but we find it hard to believe in pestilence when it descends on us. There have been many plagues, there, there have been as many plagues in the world have, as there have been wars, yet plagues and wars always find people equally unprepared." Uh, end quote. Pandemics, like war, moreover, offer an opportunity to imagine a demonized enemy, an opportunity we invariably seize. Demonizing people is often racist, and demonizing the environment, ecophobic. Pandemics encourage ecophobia. Another implication uh, in the metaphor about beating the enemy is far more material than metaphorical. We have all heard about the wholesale slaughter of chickens and pigs and cows, euphemistically described as culling. The ethical difference here, by definition, ecophobia, to the lives of animals is disturbing and destructive in the long run. Post-COVID-19 life will require us to revisit nature-denying behaviors that right now are helping us. One of the lessons COVID-19 is teaching us is that what is ecophobia in one time and place is survival in another. At this point, I think it's probably a good idea to come back uh, to the notion of ecophobia with a few uh, explanatory comments. Context is all. Survival responses are not ecophobia, uh, a comment I qualified earlier. But it bears repeating that what is a survival response in one context is raw ecophobia in another. After a hike on a hot summer's day, I will immerse my entire head uh, in the icy waters of the Lynn Valley stream in, uh, in uh, North Vancouver, British Columbia. I'll open my mouth while my head is underwater and drink until I get brain freeze. I don't think that I would do such a thing in the Han River in Seoul or the Tamashui River in Taipei or the Ganges. When the survival response of the Han River or the Tanshui or the Ganges, however, becomes a fear of any uh, free flowing water in the world, then we have ecophobia. Ecophobia is the survival instinct gone mad. It's easy to see how this can happen, surrounded as we are by threats. I mean, one doesn't want to be an alarmist, but the fact is that we're immersed in viruses, in germs, in bacteria, and we're surrounded by bugs. And while it's perhaps true that we, quote, cannot overestimate the evil that flies do, end quote, as Philip Roth explains in Nemesis, a novel about polio, neither can we live in fear of every bug that comes our way every dirty surface we touch, and every smell that's not quite right. Yet the previous sentence feels a bit disingenuous, at least as a blanket statement. The responses of city and country people toward the environment obviously differ. If there's a bug in my house in Vancouver, I may wonder how it got in before ushering it back outside. If I have a bug in my penthouse condo in Seoul, my first thought is that it may be nesting somewhere. Context is all. Bugs in Mumbai and bugs in Saskatoon are not the same. Different city, different climate, different culture, different responses. Again, what is survival in one place is ecophobia in another. Entangled with our ecophobic reflex toward COVID-19 too are a number of other things. Mm, sexism, individualism, racism. Detractors and not so well-meaning scholars who feel threatened by the notion of ecophobia um, have asked for a template and not getting one have dismissed ecophobia. We all know that desire for a one or two sentence summary of ecophobia. 
So, well, okay, here it is. The ecophobic condition exists on a spectrum and can embody fear, contempt, indifference, or lack of mindfulness, or this, some combination of these toward the natural environment. While its genetic origins have functioned in part to preserve our species, for instance, the fight or flight response, the ecophobic condition has also greatly serviced growth economies and ideological interests. Often a product of behaviors serviceable in the past, but destructive in the present, it's also sometimes a product of the perceived requirements of our seemingly exponential growth. Ecophobia exists globally on both macro and micro levels, and its manifestation is at times directly apparent and obvious, but it's also often deeply obscured by the clutter of habit and ignorance and context is everything. As with ecophobia, so too with COVID-19. Responses have been far from uniform globally, but the eco ecophobic reflex has been irrepressible. Globally, pandemic discourse sells as entertainment because it's a topic that we can relate with, a topic full of matters that haunt and threaten matters response. Pandemic discourse covers matters that we really don't want to think about too much. For instance, our material entanglements with animals or genetic materialism in the past. A widespread amnesia haunts humanity. From century to century, amnesia is in full play. And today, we seem to have forgotten everything that happened in 1918 with masks and quarantines and individuality and social welfare, and pandemic fatigue and so on. I had certainly not been taught uh, in school about the 1918 uh, flu, though it has come back into history with the current pandemic. But where the hell was it until now? Where? And it was forgotten. And we've forgotten other things too. At the very moment that it announces an environmental crisis, COVID-19 silences discussion of the very environment that it broke the Media coverage of climate change, at least until COP26, has been all but absent during the uh, pandemic. CNN remarked once about how 9-11 trumped climate change in the news. And I, I'd like to read the quotation here. Uh, after 9-11, the world's attention shifted from fighting international, shifted to fighting international terrorism. Climate issues took a back seat. And all the while, greenhouse gas emissions continued to soar. We witnessed the same thing with COVID-19, at least before COP26, with most of the world's attention shifting to fighting the virus while environmental issues took a back seat. People have made much about our clear skies, about how greenhouse gas emissions plummeted during the pandemic, but these won't make much difference. Think about it this way, says renowned Canadian climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, quote, We've been putting a brick on a pile every month since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Last year, we put 20% smaller bricks on that pile that has thousands and thousands of bricks on it already. Those 12 or 24 slightly smaller bricks are not going to make a big difference. Even at a 7% reduction, emissions for 2020 uh, will be roughly the same as for 2011, says Corinne Leclerc, one of the authors of a study in Nature uh, last year. Clearly, we need to be circumspect with the news about how great our lockdowns have been for the environment. COVID-19 has, however, shown us that we can make immediate changes, that we can shut off fossil fuel taps virtually overnight, and that we make delays really only in the interests of preventing financial problems short-term financial consequences, because so immediate, seem more horrifying than long-term environmental ones. Mindfulness, circumspection. Perhaps we just need to suck it up and take the pain now. The problem is, so, is that so very much of how we see the world is mediated through other voices, narratives that are in the service of interest that are perhaps not the interests of the planet. And let's make no mistake about it. 
we are a very credulous species. I mean, we're gullible. Yeah. I think we will remember this. Don't, don't, be so, don't, be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What is, it, you're, you're saying, saying it's a falsehood, and they're and giving Sean Spicer, Spicer our, our press secretary, secretary gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains alternative facts. Alternative facts, alternative facts, facts for the five facts he uttered. Hey, Chuck, 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 Miller for the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts, they're falsehoods. If it's on the internet or in the news, even alternative facts pass as real. And you remember Mr. Trump and his you know, counselor, shall we say, the one who said that lies are alternative facts. But we should not be too readily persuaded about the eco virtues of digital media. Zoom meetings are certainly better than everyone flying everywhere but cloud storage. Again, best to be circumspect with the news. But the problem here is that the news is all most of us have since. Uh, we're not MIT emissions researchers. Uh, we really do need to be mindful about what we consume. I mean, not only food, but narratives too. How we know what to do and what not to fear is often the product of, narr of the narratives we consume. How media narrate the material is obviously important as it determines both the imagined contours and the possible trajectories that ecophobia and viruses can take. Ecomedia eco, eco often acts as a transmitter of ecophobia through its enmeshment with other rights-denying behaviors. The enmeshment of ecomedia eco with ideologies that have a proven record of marketability and consumption is indeed problematical. We know, for instance, that sexism sells well and that it sells whatever it is attached with, hence the prevalence of the phrase Mother Nature, even in sources that are evidently trying to address the problem, albeit reiterating and reinforcing it. Much of pandemic discourse is filmic, and much of this filmic material is science fiction. 28 Days Later, World War Z, I Am Legend, and so on. And, no one, ha and, and one has to wonder just how effective this entertainment is in moving minds and hearts. Like entertainment, News indulges in the very things it seems to be critiquing. I've said before and would like to repeat here that sexist, anthropomorphic, and clearly ecophobic metaphors of a malevolent nature are counterproductive and are simply not going to help us to make the environmental crises any better. On the contrary, such sentiments, although they may sell well, are simply perpetuating the idea that nature and women should be controlled. This is the very kind of sexist ecophobia that has produced the kinds of troubles we currently face. But it sells well, and there is receptivity to endorsements of attitudes that deprive others of liberty. After all, these very attitudes have allowed slave owners, sexists, and colonialists, the founders of the United States, to thrive. It's telling the most commercially successful film about veganism to date is the Schwarzenegger et al. flick entitled The Game Changers, a shocking example of a post-truth alternative fact world. If you're not familiar with it, it's a Netflix film with a host of luminaries behind it, Martin Scorsese, James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jackie Chan, and a host of professional athletes and actors, famous directors and doctors <clears throat> who claim to have discovered veganism as a new healthful diet. But this is just dishonesty, seriously. Ecofeminists were onto it long, long before these guys were on the scene. Problem is, they people swallow this shit thinking it's real, just as they do lies about COVID-19. Mainstream media seems to enjoy pretending that all of this was unimaginable, unpredictable and inevitable, unimaginable. That's the word CNN's Nick Robertson used to describe the streets of London on the 23rd of March, 2020 following British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's stay-at-home order. But it was imagined. Danny Boyle's 2002 post-virus apocalypse horror film, 28 Days Later, shot scenes of desolate streets and thoroughfares in London, one of them Piccadilly Circus, precisely the spot Nick Robertson was serving when he said that images of desolation were unimaginable. 
Did I mention we're a credulous species? To say that it's unimaginable is simply dishonest. To neglect meat eating as the cause of this desolation is similarly dishonest. How we consume narratives and food will determine how we act in the world. Indeed, how we are able to act. Ecomedia is a huge and growing topic and its importance to how the ecofood reflex is generated is not to be underestimated. In a book coming out next year entitled COVID-19 in International Media, Global Pandemic Perspectives, uh, it may be out actually. There is uh, a very valuable insight about mediation that I'd like to read in full here. The authors state, one tension in communication about COVID-19 is a very real difference in understanding and expectations between scientific and other audiences. A key characteristic of scientific writing is that content should convey scientific information and also instructs a reader how to replicate the described experiments. Other audiences like healthcare providers or patients have different needs that professional medical writers also need to understand and meet. The content of, clinical of the clinical manuscript must be presented in a neutral manner and attempts to sway readers with emotional or melodramatic presentations are sharply frowned upon. This tone contrasts with how media outlets currently address uh, COVID, the COVID-19 infection and COVID the COVID-19 disease, and the contrast between media presentations of information about COVID-19 and scientific presentations is important because reader expectations are very different among people seeking medical or healthcare information and those seeking to make social or political commentary. The problem is that most people find scientific, or at least a lot of people, find scientific discourse utterly boring. And such discourse, if it is to reach most people, needs to be mediated. That means carried through mainstream media outlets. And one of the ways these media make the material more accessible is through commonly accepted and understood metaphors, metaphors that have relied for their purchase on sexism and ecophobia. If the material is to reach a lot of people, then it needs to be mediated, carried through mainstream media. Obviously, one of the ways these media make the material more accessible, um, as I said, is through um, these metaphors with which we are familiar. Moving forward means understanding that there's no foolproof template and that the medium and the context are vital for understanding how the ecophobic um, reflexes come into play. If nothing else, one thing is certain, it does come into play. That's a universal. How it comes into play, that is not a universal. Okay, let me skip a slide here. It's easy to look back and say, oh, we should have done better. COVID-19 requires us to look at our behaviors en voyage, uh, in medias res, as it were, to look at our behaviors as we perform them, to be mindful of the ecophobic reflex as it happens, because the stakes are high. And we really don't have time for a plan B anymore. My talk today has been all about helping us to see those ecophobic reflexes to the COVID-19 pandemic, and hopefully to change some of the behaviors, or at least to be mindful of their effects. And at this point, I would like to finish my talk and thank you uh, for coming to this YouTube um, presentation and Professor Opperman, I think you're going to take over from here. Yes, thank you very much. It was really very enlightening and mind-opening, and uh, I'm sure uh, it has provoked many, many questions. And um, those of you who are listening, um, could you please write your questions in the private chat window and your comments? Okay, um, they're gonna come out, but um, may I start with asking a few questions? Please do. 
Okay. Um, first of all, I read your books and your ecophobia hypothesis is, of course, uh, um, mind boggling, uh, if I may use that metaphor. Uh, but there are a few things that come to my, uh, my mind about uh, the particularity of this e ecophobic responses or ecophobia. Uh, particularity of it to human beings. I mean, are there any animals um, one might say that exhibit such ecophobic reflexes? Or is it simply unique to human beings? Or the same was true for uh, biophilia too, as a matter of fact. So biophilia and um, ecophobia are, if we, if we look at this as a spectrum condition, and um, we see ourselves as being somewhere on that spectrum condition. Um, it's not really the same kind of model that we can use for animals, uh, because animals don't, there's no evidence to me that animals display ecophobia, whereas there is a, a lot of evidence that uh, people such as E.O. Wilson and the contributors to uh, his book, The Biophilia Hypothesis, uh, have found that animals do have uh, biophilic reactions, that they are kind to each other. Um, that is the theory. Uh, it remains a hypothesis because there's not enough empirically verifiable evidence uh, that animals are biophilic. But True. there's more evidence that animals are biophilic than there is that they are ecophobic. There's none. There's no evidence that they're ecophobic. That that uh, you know that an animal will demonize the environment. Um, so I think that's the best answer that I can give. That you know that ecophobia is is a uniquely human trait, uh, whereas biophilia is not. I don't know how satisfying that would be uh, to uh, to uh, people who work with animals, uh, animal psychologists. I don't know uh, behavior. You know, animal uh, people who study an animal behavior and that kind of thing. I don't know how satisfying the answer would be. But I don't. I don't think. I don't see. I don't have any evidence for ecophobia, ecophobia among animals. Even even the you know, the so-called higher primates, uh, you know, bonobos, chimpanzees, and gorillas, um, do not, to me, uh, seem it would, to do. It would be very interesting to ask them, especially those who are working with chimpanzees and uh, those with working with orangutans and scientists, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, um, yes. who are studying the behavior. And, and communication processes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, some people are interested in finding about passive eco ecophobia. Um, those who have read your book, Ecophobic Hypotheses, um, uh, have noticed that you talk about uh, passive ecophobia. Um, but you skirt that topic. Uh, could you please uh, expand on that? I mean, they, sure. they are interested in finding out whether there is passive ecophobia or not. It's a bit elusive in the book, they say. Um, there. And, yeah, um, thank, you, thank you for that question. And, and thank you for translating the questions that are coming up, uh, which are written in Turkish. I, I, I don't know any, any uh, Turkish. and. Uh, yeah, I think one of the the best ways to to come at the matter of passive ecophobia is to is to think about crosswalks uh, and the many crosswalks there are in cities and in countries and all over the world, and a lot of these crosswalks have um, paint on them telling us where we should walk and where we should not walk. You don't want to walk into traffic, and it's useful to have uh, these lines painted on the crosswalks and, in fact, lines painted on the road to to tell where the cars should go and where they shouldn't go. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with ecophobia? Um, well, that all that paint uh, that's poured those millions 
of liters of toxic paint that's poured onto the roads all over the world uh, or even poured onto the side of buildings. We wouldn't take that paint and pour it into our children's or our parents' soup bowls because it's toxic. We wouldn't pour it into the oceans. Uh, we wouldn't willy-nilly dump it into fields um, because we know that it's toxic and it would be a bad thing. But we don't give it a second thought when we paint our houses or our fences or our crosswalks. We're utterly indifferent. And that indifference to nature uh, has on some level to be recognized as ecophobia, has to be recognized as the indifference itself has to be recognized uh, as uh, a thing that isn't good, that's very destructive, that's not, that, that cannot in any way be categorized as biophilia. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question of passive ecophobia, uh, but you know the the painting of things generally, I think, is is a far more passive kind of ecophobia than say a, a factory farm or uh, you know dragnet fishing or um, the, the the cutting of first growth forests. Still ecophobia, but. Passive. Yeah, okay. Um, another uh, question. Um, you talk a lot about COVID-19 and you clarified it uh, quite a bit, but the question is, um, uh, is it an eco, I mean, that, that's one question coming uh, from those who are watching. Is it an eco? Would be would it be an okay? Let me translate like this. Would it be an ecophobic uh, reaction uh, to the virus, the way we act, uh, all the measures we have taken, or would it be considered as a, a real a real fear uh, of the virus? Or what's what's the difference between an ecophobic? response and a fearful, uh, legitimately fearful uh, response. Is, is, is there a connection? Or yeah, there is a connection. Uh, there, there is a connection and, and it's, it's, it's one that I was you know, trying to get at with the mud skippers that I remember going for a run in, in Taiwan and in the, uh, beside the river, there's a kind of an intertidal zone and there's, there are these little mud flats and there are mud skippers on the mud flats. And, uh, mud skippers are these these weird little fish that live half their time out of the water, half the time in the water, and they they walk. And when you uh, when you're near them, and you know you make a noise, they'll all run back into their holes. And this is natural. This is what they do. Um, if you if you run into a field full of of geese, the geese will take flight. They will run away. It's natural. Uh, and if we're confronted with a deadly virus. We're going to hide in our homes, and I don't think that that's ecophobia. I think that's as natural as a pool of fish fleeing, a flock of birds flying, you know, a herd of buffalo running. Uh, we are no different from the animals whose behaviors we reflect. Uh, but our current behaviors uh, evoke, evoke responses that are reflexive in a lot of ways that are. Um, that these reflexes themselves are uh, potentially ecophobic uh, and and result in compulsions. And when when our survival responses extend beyond uh, what's rational and beyond what's uh, what produces survival, uh, when it becomes a phobic reaction, when we're scared to eat something with our bare hands uh, without getting rid of every single germ on our hand first. I'm sorry, there's something wrong with that. Uh, and, and we know that uh, our, our, microbi our, our gut flora, the, the microbial world in our stomachs is a reduced thing. It's much, much, uh, more 
of a, uh, a lesser thing than it was a century ago. We know this. Uh, our gut flora is a diminished thing. And I'm thinking of the poem, what to make of a diminished thing. And I'm trying to work that phrase into my response here that our gut flora is a diminished thing. And whenever we, uh, you know, outside of the pandemic, whenever we're washing our hands to the point of having no germs on it, this is, this is not a healthy thing. You know, this is, this is bio, this is ecophobic. And so, okay, so, um, so are you saying that there's a, I'm sorry, I'm interfering, but are you saying that there is a fuzzy line or an overlap between a legitimate yeah, fear, um, the legitimate condition or legitimate fear, let's put it that way. On the one hand, ecophobic reactions on the other. Yeah. Yeah, there's a fuzzy line, and we need to be careful. First of all, there is a line, uh, and that and that we have been crossing it, yeah. uh, and that and and that there are going to be consequences, and there will be consequences down the road. Uh, there will be consequences uh, from our uh, sanitizing, and you know one of the consequences is going to be developmental disorders. It's a it's a proven fact. That there are, you know, there are developmental disorders that result from uh, having a diminished microbial um, uh, uh, gut uh, environment. We know this, so you know, I think we need to be very circumspect. We need to be very careful in 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 seeing, you know, what we need to do to survive, but in understanding also that that. Uh, there are things that we're going to need to stop doing after uh, after the fear has vanished. I mean, there's there's the the mud skippers that go into their holes uh, when danger appears come out uh, when the danger disappears. They don't keep doing it. They don't become afraid of outside of their holes because that would be phobic. You know, that would be weird. And you know, we're the sort of species, and we got to where we are by being obsessive compulsive, I suppose. Um, but we're going to have to let go of some of the things that, that we've been doing. Uh, otherwise, you know, and, and this fear, this fear that Michael Pollan has talked about uh, of, of bacteria, that is uh, by its nature ecophobic. But we, we need to survive. Does that yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> Um, I would agree with all of that. Um, uh, the, the, there's a question from a graduate student. Is, is there any way uh, would ecophobia be uh, a kind of a harmful, harmful to, to us? Um, probably this is a kind. Of, this is a question concerning um, human psychology. In what way would it be harmful? I, I, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Would ecophobia, um, the, the student is asking, would ecophobia be harmful? Yes. To our psychology? Sure. Um, okay, I mean, I would know how to answer yeah, I mean, that. Like, like, any other phobia? Uh, you know, I mean, you know if, if it's, say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm interfering again. If it's a pedophobia and if it's uh, harmful, it needs to be treated, right? You have to go through a psychotherapy. Are you, would you agree with this? Well, I, I don't know. You know, if, I mean, it, if if you have a, an issue with, I remember somebody at my university um, had an issue with his, his door being locked, and he would stand there checking the the door for a very long time. Uh, to see if it was locked. I don't know if he needs psychotherapy for that so much as he needs to recognize that you know when, when you, you check the door once or twice it's locked. You don't need to stand there for 45 minutes doing it. And I, you know part of uh, what I see my work as doing is um, bringing this idea that it's not our ethical relationship with the world isn't what you know Wilson and Eric Fromm said it is. It's not biophilic. That biophilic is simply one point on the, on the spectrum, and that it, there's a whole biophilia ecophobia spectrum, and that we're somewhere there. This is the first step. 
uh, we need to recognize that we're somewhere on that spectrum and, and and then we need to recognize that there are things that we're doing that are really really bad for the world and um, and once we recognize that there are things that we're doing that are really bad for the world and that don't have any uh, survival basis uh, then we can stop doing them and so I mean I'm not sure that we need counseling to stop doing that uh, so much as recognition, you know, that, that this is something that's wrong. Uh, is it bad? Yeah, it's bad. Uh, I mean, ecophobia is not, um, not a good thing. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't promote the well-being of the planet. Uh, and to be mindful of, uh, of how we relate with the environment is it's what we're all about I mean, it's what it's it's why we do our work in the environmental humanities it's why we do eco criticism you know, it's why we read you know kim stanley robinson and, and ruth ozaki and, and uh, you know and linda hogan and, and so on so yeah it's a bad thing but we can change okay. i'm very I'm very hopeful that that you know that we have the ability to to change that we can you know understand that meat you know for instance is is not a sustainable thing uh, and and uh, change our habits. Okay, and uh, before we end, actually we don't have much time left. There's one more question, and if you can uh, if you can answer um, quickly, um, then we, we, because this is a question from another student. If we are diagnosed with this uh, ecophobia thing, like if we know we have ecophobia, would that help us change our behavior towards the environment and towards the non-humans? Just very, very briefly, please, before we end, because I just wanted to ask this question from this person. Yeah, I, I guess so. But people can be very stubborn, you know? I mean, take, for example, uh, you know, a person who knows something is bad, uh, can continue doing it even though a person knows it's bad. You know, I mean, uh, most people who smoke know that smoking is bad and yet continue to do it. So knowledge of something isn't a guarantee that there's going to be a change. Uh, but not having that knowledge is a bad thing. So, you know, the work that I do in in talking about and theorizing ecophobia and, and taking questions that are, are really sometimes very difficult because it's, just, it's still a new area. Um, Doing this work is is all about you know uh, making that knowledge available, and what people do with it is is up to them. Uh, you know, uh, people do things that with knowledge of how bad they are for their health or for the environment, uh, and um, you know whether that changes depends, I guess, on how the information is presented, uh, and you know what the what the benefits are to. Well, the perceived benefits are to you know to the self and to the world um, for making these changes, but I, I do think that uh, knowledge of of our uh, the, the ways that we act badly to the world uh, can really change people. And you know, I, I look at things like films like uh, from Kip Anderson, uh, you know, cow cowspiracy and sea spiracy, and and the immensely good work that they do in showing. The relationship between our exploitative relationship with with fish and with and with uh, you know so-called livestock that animals that walk on the ground here the incredibly good work that that these kinds of media these kinds of film have done in producing knowledge that people then have uh, about their ecophobic although neither film uses the word, word, word ecophobia but these films uh, make available knowledge that people can then use to decide whether or not to change their behaviors. And, and uh, I'm uh, very confident and very hopeful uh, about us, about our species, that with knowledge, we're gonna change. And we're gonna make the changes that are necessary and become a lot more mindful and better uh, you know, co-inhabitants in this world. Yeah, you have finished with the uh, gift of hope, actually, as your uh, final words present a gift of hope to the planet, to us, to those who have been listening to us. Thank you very much once again uh, for uh, presenting this very uh, interesting and also um, 
topic that, that we are living through, you know, we are experiencing this. And thank you for the questions. Thank you very much. And I think, and, uh, um, I'd like yeah. to thank the audience and you for making this possible. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, okay then. Goodbye, everyone.